Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are around the world, and welcome to another episode of Endurance Chat. My name is Michael Zolivari, and joining me today and tonight, we've got Cookie Monster FL, Austin Zetsman. Austin, it's been a long time. It's time that we do the classic Floody and Cookies Intimate Hour again. Yep, and with the uh, the way time zones work, uh, it's I can almost say good morning to both of us then. Oh, it's getting close. It's getting close. We're, we're pushing this right up at the line. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't you just hate that every single part of the world does ES, uh, daylight saving time slightly differently? It's the worst. Oh, yeah, and then uh, you've got like a 30-minute time zone difference or something yeah, like that. Yeah, because crazy. We're, we're cool like that. And also, it's like a, a, uh, Adelaide's just turned on winter, so it's been like six degrees today. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, the the only thing that anybody tells us whenever it feels cold down here is like you live in a fill in the blank hot climate temperature with a beach, man. How do you how you know, why how how's it possible you could be cold? Like I mean, winter you know, still exists. Like, oh well yeah, win- winter still exists. Like I mean, yours yours is more in a potentially like uh climate like four seasons inducing climate sort yeah. of whereas ours is just, just hot but we <laughs> still get the, it's yeah but you still i don't know about how you guys get with the humidity and all that but uh it we, definitely still feels it it tends to be uh, cold. It, it tends to be pretty dry here in adelaide um except for when it, uh, like when it gets humid it just rains so you know that's that's good that means that whenever oh. whenever it's hot it's just it's just hot it's just super hot and i miss that i really miss that right, hey we're, we're to talk about sports cars and not just the weather <laughs> well you know we haven't done one of these in a while this is so. true this is true. We haven't done uh, just you and me for a little while. Hey, Cookie, there was a race uh, in the yeah. World Endurance Championship like last week. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I was on vacation, so that's great. But Did you... I managed to watch the whole thing and yeah, oh, we're good. To... We're good. Watch the whole thing on vacation? Dude, that sounds like no, 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 no. Afterwards, oh. afterwards, afterwards. Yeah. Okay. That sounds I like, like I, less I... than the dream. Yeah, well, I told I told a few people that had watched the race or were watching the race at the time. I was like, do not to spoil anything and i guess when the cadillac crashed i got a bunch of uh emoji eyeballs sent to me so i was like all right if that's if that's the updates i get that's fine that's okay. at least me intrigued but uh yeah so i managed to uh watch it mostly spoiler free like two or three days late but, nice uh, i also had to watch it done. i also had to watch it late because i was in in a wedding the next day uh for my stupid longtime friend who if she does listen to this and i doubt she will hi nikki it was wonderful to be a part of your special day but also i was sad that i missed the race (laughs) yeah it was uh it was genuinely you know like the most interesting race we've had for a long time it was quite possibly (laughs) the most interesting wc race since what the 2016 spa francorchamps race where like an Audi, a Toyota, and a Porsche all broke down within half an hour of each other? Yeah, something like that. I mean, it was genuinely interesting. Um, unfortunate safety car at the beginning kind of really screwed the other guys, but they were already on a like a um, a safe strategy anyway, so they were going to put themselves behind the cars that didn't take drives. But, yeah. I Tim- mean, we genuinely had a ton of different competitive passing, and the Ferraris looked good yeah it looked good oh yeah so Um, like and the inclement conditions and all that was was awesome it was cold the the tire warmer uh bands were great even though i know the drivers hate them but anyway we'll we'll talk about that later there's there's a discussion there that i want to have um just, just saying that though like Typical spa weather, right? The rain's like hours before the start and it's still kind of damp. And so half the team's going to wets, half the team going to dry. Everyone on wets looks like a hero to start off the race because it's still like damp enough to get some pace. But then as soon as the track dries out, they're just all gone. And like we saw, yeah, as you said, the Ferraris go down a lap. Uh, the Corvette also went down a lap. Uh, there was a few a few uh, people with a bit of egg on their face after that first little stint in the race. Do you, Do you think... Uh, running on wet, or at least having both cars on the same strategy, was the smart move at the start of the race. No, but I'm. I also forgive um, a lot of the teams for doing it uh, because it, it was it was right at that cusp of whether or not to do it or not to do it. And I can easily understand where a lot of the newer teams were just like, "No, nah, I'm not taking that risk." Yeah. And it just, uh, especially if, if we're just specifically talking about the uh, the hybrid cars, then, um, you know, experience pace that, you know, that's almost all I could say mm. because Toyota have 
you know, had a lot of experience with this car. Uh, they've had a lot of experience between what's dry and what's wet. Um, and so they made that quick decision, which put one of their cars um, all the way at the back of the grid to start. But at the same time, you know, I, I think their their comfort with knowing exactly what's going to happen yeah. <laughs> with the race um, by just doing it so many times just clearly paid off here. And um, I think that's where it was. Uh, um, like, it, it it became a no-brainer decision later on, like, you know, like hindsight. But uh, at the time, it... it the Toyota decision made complete sense uh, well, from their experience. So. It, it was a really interesting decision because that leading Toyota, the one that qualified in the front row and didn't bin it in no rouge in the qualifying, uh, that dropped like a stone. It had absolutely no pace on the slick tires to start the race. It really was only halfway through that first stint that that Toyota, I think it was the number eight Toyota, uh, actually started to come back through the field. Sorry, it was the number seven, my bad. Um, but the number eight was uh, was delayed in qualifying after that crash, of course. But once the track dried out, they were absolutely uh, flying everyone away and it looked like they'd made a masterstroke. Uh, so they, they did it the hard way and that's pretty typical of what you could say about the race in general because bloody hell everyone did it the hard way <laughs> yeah and I, I think to just uh just part of it as well being i think with the, the the tire warmer bands or at least the limitations on those the very cold conditions obviously with the rain um just created a very 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 cold track with cold tires i mean you can warm the tires up in the uh, in the installation laps and that extra pace lap that they had for the race. But um, when push comes to shove, uh, we saw problems with a lot of the hypercars with warming up their tires. And I doubt, uh, you know, Toyota was, you know, has that figured out yet. So I feel like, too, um, their their lack of pace in those first, you know, even a uh, handful of laps was just terrible because part of it is everybody was just trying to warm their tires up, especially if you're on a slick track like that. So... Um, you know, it, it it was definitely more treacherous conditions than I think anybody um, uh, watching or, or looking at it would have assumed. I mean, outside of the, the Toyota, you know, crash and qualifying. Um, but it definitely you can you can tell like just how how extreme it is when it comes to, you know, if there is a cold environment temperatures at the track with the lack of tire warmers on these, especially at these hypercars. Um, there are a huge handful. Like they're just massively twitchy and require multiple laps to to really heat their tires up. So, um, I because I watched the start again because it was very dramatic. Like I mean, yeah. they re- I mean they just fell off like five six seconds a lap almost. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I attribute a lot of that to to their tires too, just not getting up the temperature either. So. Yeah, and especially the, the slick on a damp track as well. Like you have to, you mm-hmm. have to put the energy into the slick to warm it up, but you can't put the energy into it if it's not dry. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we've we've already mentioned the the tire the cold tires tire warmer ban a few times. Let's ju- jump straight into this discussion. We saw over the course of the weekend. Uh, Brendan Hartley make a mistake at the top of Eau Rouge on cold tires on his outlap in qualifying, which bin the car. We saw one of the Proton Porsches spin out the top of Eau Rouge on their outlap in qualifying. Luckily, they didn't hit anything. Um, and then during the race, we saw, I think it was four incidents um, of race uh, of cars on their outlap crashing. So obviously the the high profile one is the 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 Ferrari number fifty the AF Corsa Ferrari with uh, and, uh Antonio Fioco behind the wheel that hit the wall coming down the endurance pit straight uh like literally hundred meters outside out of the out of the pits and it spun into the wall there was also the bike collars that spun on the exit of the pit lane um and I believe there was one more but I can't remember off the top of my head um these incidents all have all happened because of cold tires on a cold track uh, and the cars not being able to generate the heat in the tires to get them in their right operating window. Uh, so this is because there's a tire warmer van this season. Um, we've talked about, well, we, we have known this from the very beginning of the season that there has been a tire warmer van. Uh, it's part of the drive to make a more environmentally uh, sustainable sport. Uh, those tire warmers create well, they, they cost quite a lot of energy, uh, not just to operate, but to transport as well. Um, so uh, the question I have, Cookie, is how do we manage cold track temperatures on outlaps? Uh, this is 
we don't, we don't, we never like seeing cars end up in the wall, and especially high profile cars like the hypercars, um, who don't have the the mass to really generate the the tire temp the ch- temperature they need early on the lap, um, compared to say a GT car, uh, and they've all made contact with the wall somewhere because of having tires that are basically rocks. How do we manage this? Oh, right. I mean, my only. My only thing would be potentially uh, to have them slightly warmed so that, you know, they're not they're not sitting in ovens, but they're, you know, they're sitting on heating pads or something. Um, and just having, you know, some kind of fabric mesh thing that you could put on a, a just a, a, you know, one of those easy buildable metal shelves, you know, that you can sack the tires on. something Like, like if it's all cost savings and energy stuff. Um, then a compromise where you're giving them like a, a eighth of the the heating there, but at least it's something. Um, because I genuinely uh, like the 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 cold uh, or uh, the uh, what am I trying to say? The the cold temperature is starting off with the tires simply because it's it, it gives it down to driver skill a little bit more, and um, and it adds another element to pit stops uh, as well as um, you know, like a, an overall encompassing pit stop. Yeah. So, I, I just, I personally think that it's, it's, it's entertaining at least for me as the fan because I guess, I guess I like Team Chaos or you know whatever. <laughs> yeah, but um, you are the agent yeah, of Chaos no, Cookie. Yes, yes, I am. I, I accept that uh, title, uh, with uh, with honor. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I do, I do understand where it's coming from spot it was extreme just because it, it was it was wet and cold and damp whatever um so i can understand where you would need maybe a little bit of heat of the tires but i don't really want to see uh tire warmers back so maybe if there's some more uh you know green solution that doesn't use up a lot of energy to potentially heat the tires up a little bit and then give it to the drivers um, where it's still going to require them to drive, you know, like to, to drive cautiously for a lap or two, but um, they're not, you know, immediately bending it with 30% mm. power going yeah. down a straight. Because that, I I get that where that's crazy. So, yeah, um, the, the concern that I have is that at what point does it become a safety issue? You know, uh, if, if we, we need to be so careful and so tentative on our outlaps to the point where a mistaken stab of the throttle a hundred meters out of the pits is going to ruin your race. Like uh, not just ruin your race, but also potentially take someone out. Like, you know, it, it was lucky that there wasn't a car just to his outside that could get caught up in it um, in Rivera's case. So at, at what point does it become a safety issue? And this isn't like the first time either that we've seen tire issues in a top level prototype class uh remember the uh, the daytona 24 hours i believe it was 2017 when we had the esm leisure leading the race um on those stone cold continentals because it was about negative four degrees at daytona uh and on his outlap i think it was also brendan hartley uh spun up the banking uh, because because the tires were were freezing and they didn't have any tire warmers. Like this isn't the first time it's happened. So at what point does it become a safety issue? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I think safety is always going to play a part, especially when we're talking about things like this um, or just anything in general. So, I, I, not that I dismiss the the safety aspect of it, but um, it it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't factor as much into, into my personal equation than it probably does for most other people. So okay. I like if um, cuz again this is this is stuff as in I mean if a driver doesn't execute, you know, a couple of quarters correctly and they spin out or whatever um, or they touch the grass, they make a mistake, you know, is that a safety issue? I'm not saying that the the, the driver of the Ferrari made a mistake in lighting the tires up to, you know, whatever percentage, and it immediately spins on the straight. However, I mean, do I think that we're going to see this a lot moving forward? I don't really think so, because I think that this was a learning lesson. And so regardless of whether or not changes will be made to how this is done, I I feel like teams and drivers have had that wake-up call, you know, regardless, because... You know, we've seen now extremes in qualifying and in the race 
where it's, well, what we've got right now is no tire warmers, and what we can do is not crash. So even if you feel like you're giving up a little bit extra time, we just, you know, there's, you know, the limit is right there. So yeah. just don't try to exceed that. The, the classic, um, if, uh, to finish first, first you have to finish. Yeah, so I, like, that. that's the thing is that, Sure, it's a, it, it's a safety issue, but I also think it's a safety issue even if you have if we had tire warmers for you to just immediately go 100 percent mm. like into the corner at the same you know, with the same breaking point and uh, you know at the same throttle usage that you did before you came to the pits. Like you have extra fuel, you didn't maybe didn't take tires. Like uh, stuff's going to be a little more cold, so you're not going to you're not going to drive the car the same way that you did when you came to the pits it's, it's it was just the same thing here it was just more extreme without the tire warmers so uh my my point being just it's i i think this is a limit that the drivers found and i don't think they're going to cross it again um but hey i could be completely wrong and we might we might see something extreme come up again and then in which case i'll probably change my tune and be like hey let's let's look into warming them up a bit more or something yeah, so that's that's kind of what I think has already been happening. Uh, so I think the the Ferrari drivers and I think Mike Conway as well has quoted an article on Daily Sports Car uh, being cr- critical of the the uh, ban to tire warmers. Um, and there's already a look, according to this article on Daily Sports Car, uh, to bring back some sort of tire warming for Le Mans. Um, so I, it's one of those things where like. It's all well and good to have this desire to be greener and to to be more energy efficient and to reduce our footprint in terms of you know making the sport a less uh, you know uh, environmentally impactful sport. Um, but there are consequences to doing that, and you know a written off hypercar is. And, you know, not just a written-off hypercar, but a hypercar that was out of control that could have taken out another car is maybe something that needs to be considered. Um, so maybe like having a limit on tire warmers to be only at a certain temperature so that way you can't just go gung-ho on your first lap out and you have to you fa- phase them in. So like I think the operating temperature is up around like just over 100 degrees Celsius, uh, which to yep. you is like, I don't know, Two, two twelve, two hundred and two hundred and forty stupid units. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so like, you know, maybe maybe starting at half that or a quarter, or maybe not a quarter, but like half that. So like fifty degrees Celsius or a hundred Fahrenheit might be something mm-hmm. that uh, you know can be considered. I'll give uh, everybody just uh, a set of tire warmers, just one set. That's one it set for, and so you could throw them on. Wet, so you could throw them on slicks, so you could throw them on whatever you want, whatever compound, but you only have four. Just do that, something like that, where you, you know, where I like that's what I would love to see. Like anything that induces more strategy for no necessary reason other than like an excuse to save energy or excuse to just spice the uh, some extra strategy up is fine by me. And if it means that, you know, okay, well, you know, here's here's your your extra safety or your extra pace device. But if something changes, you need to do something in the last minute. Like the precedent's been set that you got to take it easy because these things are, do not warm up very quickly. If they're not warm, like I'm fine to do that too. Mm. I would prefer your method where they're, you're able to heat the tires up to a quarter of the, the temperature that you could have previously and then save the energy time management, whatever that way. Um, but I'm also down to just, you know, let them have their, their toy back, but just not have as many of them. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's definitely solutions here. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that there is a way to significantly cut down on the energy expenditure of the, the category while also making sure that, you know, hypercars or, or, you know, sports cars don't crash on their outlap or they're not at risk of crashing on their outlap. Um, it, it, it is a it is a fine balancing act, of course, because, you know, at the end of the day, there's these are considerations that you have to make when driving as you said it's part of the skill but cookie i don't for, for me personally i don't think i should see gte cars with bronze drivers in them passing hyper cars <laughs> like because that's what ah. we saw right oh that's cool that's that's interesting to me it's Isn't like because it? it's like why why is this happening why <laughs> you know it it, it, it it sparks curiosity you're you're a weird <laughs> you're a weird cookie man <laughs> I try to be, man. I really do. You do. You do. Uh, you do well. At it. Yeah. I mean, sure. I it 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 wouldn't look good for the sport if everybody saw 
really bad GT drivers overtaking hypercars. Also wouldn't look bad if hypercars crashed at random points into other non-suspecting cars. I get it. But I just, I don't know. I mean, it is. You love the chaos. It, I love the chaos, but it also was just like, there's a lot of things in modern racing that we take for granted. And I love the fact of trying to go a little bit more old school with stuff because, hey, let's face it. A lot of the complaints and the discussions we have around motorsports are about like modern day like devices or things that are here to make the sport better or faster, but it Safer. also kind of complicates stuff a bit. And mm. we're like, hey, I wish it would be old school a bit. I wish we could do stuff like this because it would put more, you know, X Y Z into the driver's Who hand. Who needs an onboard hand. computer? Just use a carburetor yeah, and a ex- big exactly. block V eight. <laughs> Exactly. Oh yeah, God. No, that's, that's some other American. What are you talking about? Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think this is this is something that is. Uh, I think it's re- it, it can be revealing what kind of things you can do to give a more interesting race by not and and, and by not restricting um, arrow or you know BOP hmm. stuff like that. Like you're giving opportunities for the drivers or teams to uh, play with some strategy more to try to upend some stuff. And yes, I get the safety part of it. I just think that it is it is a cool departure from the norm to remove something, a modern day thing that enhances the team's ability to immediately create pace all the time and put some of that back into the driver's hands to do that themselves. Yeah. And to see which ones do it better. I like that. I I wish that there's a happy medium between the two. Uh, we'll see. And I, I think as well, part of the problem is that these cars have become so optimized now to the point where like we've had to, like the ACO have had to peg them back. Like you think about the, the peak of the LMP1H era, those cars were absolute monsters and we've certainly take a step, taken a step back with hypercar, but still these cars are at the absolute optimum that they can be. They are at the limits of the available technology which means that in order to operate at that limit, they need to be within such a tight window. And I wonder how much of not just motorsport, not well, sorry, not just WEC, but not just motorsport, but also how much sport is by you know creating that tiny window of operation by optimizing every little thing that we are losing you know the ability, as you said, to take things back a bit old school and do things the hard way because. You know, if we're if we're at the the very limits at all the time, and we're able to perform at that very fine limit because everything is optimized, as soon as something's out of the window, where it be the uh, the weather's changed or the uh, the tires are too cold, then everything kind of turns to shit. Yeah, I mean, the last thing I'll say with this because we're you know we we love to talk talk about it, but uh, is is like I've, I mean, there's even discussions too that. Not necessarily discussions, but people going like, oh, what would it be like if like F1 went, you know, old school, went, you know, so you had mostly mechanical grip instead of aero grip and whatnot. And I think that that would be totally fun. I like the lap times wouldn't be there. Uh, you know, it wouldn't look as quote unquote fast and spectacular in person on TV or whatever, but you'd have insanely good racing and you, you'd have all this money and investment to Jow directed into a completely other thing because, you know, I, I feel like the we've re- approached speed limits you know when it comes to just how much the human body can handle mm-hmm. that it's um that the more in- and the entertainment and whatnot would would see um would be seeing teams and drivers and everybody scramble to try to figure out a new way to do something or at least you know try to figure out the new strategy in order to win can, can um, you imagine like a full grid of f1 drivers in formula fords because that's what's just running through my brain at the moment take all the arrow <laughs> off them you just get a full grid of formula fords <laughs> Yeah, in my head, it's like that. It's like a, I don't know, like a like an old school Lotus and yeah. a Formula Ford cross kind of thing, but like <laughs> with like carbon fiber, oh, you know, so suspension bits so and it's, whatnot. So, so. it's S five thousand. So it's like a oh yes, a supercars S five thousand. Yeah, 100%. yeah, with, with a huge, huge, uh, uh, was it uh, throbbing scoop, girthy V eight? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's what they are. Like, okay, so in, in Australia, we have uh, one of our premier open wheel categories is S5000, which is basically take a, an engine out of a V8 supercar, so like a 5.7 liter Coyote engine, and put it in the back of a Formula 3 chassis, and that that is your race car. They sound 
phenomenal. Like, I was uh, at the Adelaide round of the supercars at the end of last year, and, like, just echoing through the streets, it was just like, oh! <laughs> oh, it's it's intense, man. So good. Um, they're not, they're louder probably than the Cadillacs, but it's, mm. that's, that's pretty much what you get when, uh, Whenever you had the or the DPS um, or even the uh, what is it uh, the Ellen uh, the uh, shoot the prototype challenges those oh, Gibson yeah, yeah, V8s yeah. yeah those things were loud too man those things were just but uh, yeah I would say the the Cadillac is one of the best sounding uh, hypercars just from the the weird hybrid but then with that like that V8 even though it's a little bit smaller than what your uh, what those uh, open wheel cars down there are doing, it still sounds amazing. So I, I can only bet that those things sound great. I can't wait to hear some uh, hypercars some t- some at some point in my life, maybe. What were we talking about? Uh, that's a great <laughs> question. What were we talking about? I know what we weren't talking about. We weren't talking about the big crash for the Cadillac at Eau Rouge. And now, Cookie, I, I, I have to admit something to you. When you said okay. at the beginning of the season... Uh, in one of our off cuts that I didn't end up putting into a podcast, that when a crash happened at Eau Rouge, uh, that we should th- round back to this conversation and th- th- you know tell everyone how white you were. I rolled my eyes and I thought, ah, oh, that'll never happen. But as it turned out, the changes they made to Eau Rouge prevented the Cadillac from bouncing back onto the circuit, which meant that it only hit the wall once, uh, which is something you were campaigning for since like, woo. 2015 so I, I, I guess i guess you were right everyone give cookie a round of applause yeah yeah i did it i did it um i also want to say too uh i i genuinely love the uh the upgrades and whatnot i don't think it took anything away from the, the track uh and it also gave like this amazing grandstand view of a crash like granted again you don't like to see a crash but it was just like it was it was weirdly like watching it in the replay and with all the camera shots with all the fans right there. It looked like it was just like an entertainment center. <laughs> it was just like, like a, a car. The, the, the Spa Francorchamps Coliseum. Yeah, it did. And then also you're just like, all right, and here we go. We're going to have a driver hit the wall, folks. And it just like, I mean, he crashed and then spun just, I mean, perfectly right in front of the stands. Like everybody's up pointing and stuff. It was just. Uh, it, it was, was a, a violent crash as well. It was like yeah. the doors came off that thing. You could like yeah. totally just reach out and touch Van der Zander's head. Yeah, and it was just it, it. I was very impressive to see how close they got. So much of that huge stands that they built uh, close to the track like that. I mean, it literally looked like. And I mean, he got out and took a took a bow. And I, I, I it literally like I was chuckling internally because it was it felt exactly how i was thinking he was just like oh okay there's a huge crowd of people that just watch me uh bin it like do a high speed crash like completely destroy a half a million dollar race car or million dollar race car and you'll see that sometimes in nascar too when they'll get out they'll just they'll bow to the crowd or something like that because they have a huge grandstand in front of them yeah and he did the exact same thing (laughs) because there's a massive and it looked pretty packed too of uh, people that were uh, applauding him as he got out because that was a huge shunt. Uh, oh, absolutely! And- I like we're, we're making a little bit of light out of this because, like, it's been very clear since that a crash happened that he was okay. But for a moment there, it was like, "Whoa, is he actually going to be okay?" Um, so when mm-hmm. like when he was moving and he got out of the car on his own steam, it was like, "Oh, thank God!" Okay, let's laugh at yes. it. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, especially that that bow too. That 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 got me so. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a scary crash. We still don't know fully what happened. Uh, they were suspecting that it was a power steering failure, but we didn't even get confirmation uh, from the team afterwards. So uh, it was some sort of a failure. But uh, he said it was like, uh, I think he said it was out of, it felt like it was out of a movie or something. Mm-hmm. So, and that, you know, that's scary when you lose steering pretty much at the at the worst part imaginable on that track. So, yeah. so- um, so to to clarify, um, heading into the daily sports car post race paddock notes, uh, the DSC was told at least that it was a malfunction to the electric power steering system. So basically, uh, the car locked up and just went straight. Which excellent. Uh, which of all the places in the world, not just at Spa Francorchamps, but in the world for that to happen, had to be Eau Rouge, didn't it? Yeah, had to be Eau Rouge or top of the mountain. Um, oh, yeah. That also would be a bad. That would also be a bad, bad time. Be, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, so Road America, turn one. Also bad, bad time. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the kink. Kink. Sorry. The kink, kink would, would be, be bad. Yeah. 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 When, when you're going like 300 kilometers per hour into a concrete wall or tire barrier, that's not a good time. Um, or do the or do the Catherine leg and lose a uh, and lose her rear wing end plate right as she's turning into the kink at Road America and Champ Car in like 2005. Yeah, I recently w- rewatched that crash because it came through the, my head and holy shit, I don't know how she managed to stay o- like on the circuit and not enter the train line. <laughs> yeah, she was totally fine. Like, yeah, it was incredible. Like, she wasn't knocked unconscious or anything. Yeah. I was just like, how is that even possible? Like, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 amazing. And like as well, uh, props to the people who redesigned Eau Rouge uh, to keep the integrity of the circuit, but also make that section safer and also create a great view. They did something that was like almost impossible, and they managed to make that work. And uh, c- c- congratulations! I mean, to it the just people. looks impressive. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I I cannot say enough about the reworks to that track. Like. I genuinely want to go to Spa now at some point because, like, I would love to sit in some of those grants. I'm sure they, like, uh, I don't know if that costs extra or something, but it would still would be nice to walk around the track and then also sit with that view. I mean, that's just an incredible view. Mm. And they got they got a spectacular show, and they got a crash right up front. So. And like as well, great, something that they stuff. don't something that they don't show on the TV cameras is you can see the main straight. Not only can you see the main straight, you can see all the rundown from Stavlo. Not only can you see that, but you can probably also see over the hill into like Puon as well. Like it's it's kind of nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the perfect place to put a huge grandstand at that track, and they nailed it. Yeah. Um, the context for that uh, crash, though, was that the Cadillac was being chased by, I think, both Ferraris at that point in time. Uh, so something else I wanted to talk about. Uh, we've got a lot of hypercars. And not only that, we saw some genuine battling for position in hypercar during this race. Like, there was one stretch of the race where we had a four-way battle for fourth place, or third place, rather, between a Porsche, both Ferraris, and a Cadillac. And, and like, we saw genuine battling for positions uh, during the race, which I don't think the likes of which we have not seen since we had Toyota, Audi, and Porsche in the same races. Like we're going back to 2016 here with how exciting just hypercar is. Like this is, I don't want to say it because I don't want to jinx it, but like this is this 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 is the golden age. Ah oh, no, I said it. Oh, oh, you did it. I did. I, I said did it. it. At least I didn't so, say this is stacked. Yeah, it's uh, it's May seventh or eighth, depending on where you're at. <laughs> and he said it. No, that's uh, it yeah. no, I mean, obviously, it's a goal. I mean, like you know, if if you know, if if the bar is set for how many uh, different manufacturers are compete at uh, at Le Mans for the top step, I mean, that seems to be what the bar is for uh, you know a golden age of, of sports car racing. Then we definitely were going to be entering one regardless. Uh, you know whether or not Toyota just stink the entire show up and make it not a like a golden age that's rusted a bit or something. <laughs> oh wait, gold can't rust crap. Um, <laughs> you know it, it remains to be seen. However, I I do think that the the gap's closing, and yeah, it was it was awesome to see genuine uh, battles on track. It was awesome to see um, the privateers. Uh, you know, obviously. The Porsche privateers uh, are kind of their own thing, but it was nice to see even the Van Wall and the, uh, the Glickenhaus be able to pass and be in battles or just stay around the camera uh, when it comes to the other hypercars. And that's what when I was watching that too, I was just like, see, that's what I was talking about with Glickenhaus. Now I don't know their whole, you know, his whole financial stake and all that, whatever, how much he wants to put in. Lamar or Grandstand, his own opinion on whatever he thinks is right. Uh, I just wish that they would have found some other way to keep running those cars and have a second car running because it just, I feel like, you know, they would be so much more of a story right now because they had, they would have had uh, just time racing. Like, mm. it just, you can tell that if they've just had a little bit more experience and they have an extra car and they just have a little bit more, you know, I don't know money in there they could easily do something um and and literally grab headlines with it because they would just do that and i just it it frustrates me to almost a a little bit because it's it's just a missed opportunity that i think i i feel like if glickenhaus just slightly did something a little bit differently whether that his it's his public persona or 
you know, his private investment into the team, I feel like the results could easily have been there for them. Yeah. And not pinning it only on, you know, having an engine blow up at Mazda at sealing that win. Because I, I, yeah. I think even if they get that win at Monza, I don't think it does really a lot outside of, um, you know, it definitely, it, it, it's a bragging point and it's something that he can tout to, to other people. But I, I just feel like, you know, the way that people would have to buy into his system, it would be way better if that car just performed just yeah. slightly better. And it would make a case of like, all right, whatever, whatever Jim does, like this car clearly can compete with other like OEMs. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter all the ifs, ands, or buts. This car is showing its worth on the track, and I like that. I want in, and I feel like that's how Porsche is getting in. That's how Cadillac's going to get some. That's how you know maybe Peugeot gets some, depending on whether or not Pescarolo, you know, is it a, actually, you know, actually comes to fruition. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I just. Part of that to me was uh, I saw that as being mix, uh, missed opportunities, especially for Glick and House, where well, I was like, man, I just feel like I feel like this is exactly what th- what they want, but it could be so much more. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just like half a step behind greatness. Um, kind of feels mm-hmm. very similar to how the whole Janetta thing played out. It feels like Janetta were always one step away from being something that was going to be good. Um, so... You know, it, it was. Uh, uh, to be fair, I don't. I haven't seen as much of the Glicken House uh, being unable, to, like un, unstable in cornering uh, as we have in the past. But also, I'm not sure if that's because we've just let, seen less of the Glicken House on TV because you know a- everything else. There's, there's <laughs> other things going yeah. on. Yeah. Um, um, something I did want to uh, uh, sling your way is a bit of a question. We saw a major incident during the race uh, between the the van wall with uh, Jacques Villeneuve behind the wheel and uh, Thomas Floor. It was it was a Flora Castellacci in the number fifty four AF Corsa Ferrari, uh, wherein uh, coming out of sort of Stavlo area, uh, a, a hypercar, I believe it was one of the Toyotas past the uh, AF Corsa Ferrari on the inside. The van all tried to follow through. They made contact and, you know, put the van, put both cars out of the race in the end. Um, is this something that we are going to see more of because we have more hypercars? Uh, are we going to see more different class crashes um, because we have more cars in the higher class? I, I think so. Uh, I, I, I would assume the odds are greater that we'll have more potential contact at Le Mans and other tracks because you do have AMs that aren't used to the amount of cars or like like the amount of times they're going to be challenged at different corners um, with extra hypercars just because there hasn't been a lot. Mm. And, um, you know, it, it's... It, I don't know. I, I feel like as a human reaction, if, if you're just used to, okay, I'm getting passed by a really fast car every once, like... I don't think there should be another one coming behind him kind of thing. Uh, it gets it gets into a habit-forming kind of deal, and I think that's just where it was, where it was just, okay, there's there's one hypercar here, and I'm not noticing that another car can immediately come behind me as soon as I'm engaging with one hypercar. You know, another one could be right up in my mirrors just simply due to that. Yeah. Um, and I, the- I just think it's... Because the pack I think racing, it's just time back. yeah, the pack racing mm-hmm. in hypercar is something that we haven't seen. So the fact that, as I said earlier, we had you know at one point a fire, a four car battle for position with a lapped car in the middle uh, in hypercar. Uh, you know, you think of trying to navigate maybe a two or three car GTM battle, or maybe even a five car GTM battle. We've seen how much GTM can kick off sometimes. Like that's going to be something that is going to raise the hairs on the back of the neck a few times maybe at Lamar, maybe later in the season um what was your read on the on the incident between the uh Villeneuve and Castellacci by the way oh I mean bracing incident um I think I I think Castellacci you know should hopefully learn a lesson for next time to be a little bit more uh, driver aware in in the mirror when especially when you have one hypercar there might there might be more uh, uh, hypercars in the mirror might be there might be multiple uh than appear or something to that effect but uh yeah i i just think it was a racing incident and then uh, obviously uh the van wall you know the driver uh who we all know is very um aggressive too so <laughs> I, I just think it was uh a case of 
uh, racing into that at both ends. So hopefully it's a lesson learned for them and other drivers as well. Just be a little more careful when, when this stuff is going on and just like, this is the new norm now. So mm. you know, uh, get, uh, get ready for multiple hypercars overtaking at the same time. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great thing to say, isn't it? This is the new norm. How, how wonderful is that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I think some of this stuff is too just new norm stuff. I, I think that's where I was uh, I was more okay with the, the the tire warmer, you know, leave it be kind of deal because I just think that this is, you know, if it's new norm stuff, it's it's not necessarily like. I mean, it's 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 again safety wise, yes, but I, I think if the drivers understand it as like this is how it is, I I don't think it's anything more than. Um, a, a couple race talking point. Yeah. Okay, we'll see how that works out. Come Le Mans, then. Um, yeah. hopefully the weather at Le Mans isn't you know trash. Uh, despite the weather, at, <laughs> despite Are you the, going this year? Uh, no, I didn't get everything sorted uh, in time. Like by the time I looked at tickets, like two days after they were available, uh, they oh, were God. all sold out. <laughs> so wonderful. Yeah, I know, right? Next year, R slash WC meetup. What a great, yeah. This is, <laughs> this is the norm. This is the norm, is it? The, the, the tickets are going to sell out a, basically a half a year You know what I should just do, right? You know what I should do? I should just convince Graham, right, uh, to let me work at Lamar and then convince him that, no, 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 I don't need to be supervised, but I need to have my travel paid for, uh, and then I can just go to Lamar uh, with a media card instead and then just not... To pretend to do work, Graham. If you're listening, yeah. please don't take any of that as serious. <laughs> oh no! I, I mean, I yeah, don't take it serious for him. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, I'll actually just work. I don't care. <laughs> I don't know, Graham. I, I, Graham works. I seem to hard. work on vacations anyway. So. That's true. This is true. Um, despite the trash weather as far as champs, the famously trash weather as far as champs. There was 72,000 people who turned up uh, for the weekend, like, or for race day, I think it was. Dude, that's that's nuts. 72,000 people for, for race day for a WEC race. What on earth is going on? Uh, new norm. Okay. Yeah, new norm, it's, I guess. Uh, it's, it's done. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, I think it's it's the hype of a lot of manufacturers that have joined uh, the, the top class. I think this is what the top class brings. Um, because it's a chance to win overall and you know um, class winners are absolutely valuable but uh, you know it's been a while since we have had a, an overall um, uh, competition uh, for the the top step of the trophy and I think that that it, it definitely draws fans mm. um, and I do think uh, some of it's the Ferrari factor um, and you know some bleed over with F1 uh, when it comes to, you know, fandoms and supporting teams and whatnot that they've supported previously. Like, we don't, you know, I'm sure you, I'm sure there's a bunch of Red Bull hats there, but uh, I, I felt like there was there was some bleed over when it can, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, fans affiliation to uh, s- some of the top teams. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously Porsche and Ferrari fans, and then you had Toyota fans there too. So, um, you know, and it, it actually becomes something of not necessarily of like, oh, this is a must see event, but it's more like, oh, let's go support our team or yeah. like let's go watch this team try to win, that yeah. kind of thing. So, kind of kind of buying into the sort of tribalism of sports sometimes. You except, you know, we're we're getting excited about car brands, of which we shall never be able to afford. Except for a Toyota. Yes. <laughs> or or a Peugeot. Or a Cadillac. Or Peugeot. Peugeot 305. All right. Um, uh, we'll leave a hypercar there for the moment. It was a Toyota 1 2, as we said, they did the hard yes. way. Ferrari grabbed another podium uh, with the 51. Yes. They did uh, nab that from the number five Porsche in the late stages. Uh, the Porsche seemed to kind of dip off as the race progressed, unfortunately, uh, with the Cadillac uh, in fifth, the remaining Cadillac in fifth. Uh, let's talk LMP2 quickly uh, because. LMP2 was a pretty cool battle. It was difficult to keep track of, I found, because of everything that was going on in the hypercar and with the safety cars kind of throwing strategy out the window continuously. But, like, this, it's the same sort of names popping up at the front every single time. It was United Auto Sports. It was uh, Team WRT. It was Prema Racing. But then you just have Inter Europol just come up there and grab a podium, which was amazing at the latter stages of the races. 
Yes, uh, and different strategies are working out uh, perfectly too uh, with Hypercar and with LMP2. I mean, I okay, sorry. Different strategies not where they work with Hypercar, but <laughs> uh, it was it was really crazy to see LMP2 and how how it, how close the field was. And we've talked a lot about how LMP2 can kind of hold station with each other, almost like TT cars. But to see uh, you know down uh, what is it Camel Straight um, and see there was four cars just literally like side by side first through fourth just running next to each other alongside each other it was crazy it looked like it was a pace lap yeah and uh so the, the how close it was with lmp2 was fantastic um and it, it got overshadowed by just the absolute adhd-ness of <laughs> hypercar yeah and um and yeah uh, and then also just the late stage chaos is with obviously the van wall, and then you had the uh, the, the Ferrari crash as um, well. Ferrari crash, and then you had the Porsche conking out, um, which uh, ripped your Porsche. Yeah, ripped. Uh, that we, was in a we, good position yeah. too. Yeah. So it was. Um, yeah, I, I feel like that's easily how Interpol was. You know, um, into Europol. <laughs> Interpol. I said it too. There Interpol. was somebody. There was the, I, I saw it twice. I, somebody in uh, on one of the Reddit chats did it, and then I saw it on like Sports Car Three Sixty Five or something like that. So it was like uh, the Interpol car. He's like no. Inter Europol. <laughs> it's like oh my god! Now I just did it. Oh shit! Just call them the um, bikers. It's fine. <laughs> but yeah, the Inter Europol car was able to take advantage of that, and I do remember there was a couple times. Um, I'm trying to remember who at the beginning of the LMP2 like got a huge advantage with the safety car um, at the beginning, but then lost it all with the second safety car. Mm. So it basically, you know, stuff. A lot of strategies yinged and yanged with the uh, with the random safety cars that came out. Pretty much not from LMP2 cars. Yeah, so. there was only I think one failure for the LMP2 car, and that was pretty early on the race. That was the Vector Sport number ten car that was parked up at Lacombe with three wheels on its wagon. Um, as they like to say. Um, but otherwise, LMP2 have been super duper clean. The one criticism I have, Cookie, the one criticism I have is that the, the cars all look the damn same. The Team WRT yep. cars and the Prema cars, there's four of them. They're all red and white and they all bloody look the same. And then you've got the, the United Auto Sports cars, which are red and white and blue. And they look the same as the Alpines, which are just blue. Like, they all just bloody look the same. It's so hard to tell them apart when they're in a battle. That, that's my one yeah. gripe. That's my one gripe with LMP2. That's what I'm saying. I mean, like you know, if if it's a spec series, my can we can we get like like a, like two consistent swooshes and give them like different colors for each car? <laughs> <laughs> like you know, you you guys can you guys can have the same livery on both cars and just do accents, but they're now ACO mandated accents. <laughs> like I don't care because yeah, I there was a couple times where I was looking at that, I was like. Those, uh, the Prima cars and the WRT cars, they have the same, like, almost design pattern to yeah, them. Yeah. It's, it's not even that they're the same colors, which they are. They almost have identical designs, which I, I don't even understand how that's possible. Like, it's just, how has it gotten that bad where two t- separate teams have the, you know almost the exact you, same livery? You know why, Cookie? It's because there's so much color in hypercar now. It's because they've they've got to they've got to crack down on the liveries for the LMP2 class because they've just completely yeah. let hypercar the the horses bolted there. They they've are you telling me they've hired all the the competent digital artists that are possible in the motorsport community? Uh, the well, hypercar clearly has. not because we spent an hour to- we spent some time talking about the Porsche's Le Mans livery and slagging off how weird that looked last week. So, <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> well, at any rate, there's like there's a there's so many now online, and just go contact Annie Blackmore. Like, what? I just don't understand. It just doesn't make sense to yeah, me. Yeah, I you spend that much money to own a the LMP2 team. Have a livery. That's interesting. I, I don't get why it's like, oh, well, we got to be stupid and generic and have the same stupid like, colors sure, every time. I'm sure the liveries are interesting in isolation, but when there's two teams that use red and white and are almost identical, it's just, it's impossible to look. It's impossible to tell them apart. Like, that's uh, when you were talking about that moment where the top four was going down the Kemmel Strait, I, I remember that vividly because I was like, I didn't realize there were three cars in the same team because it was like two WRT cars, a Prema car, and a United car. The United car was the only one that looked different. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm just I'm just saying, Flood. What they need to do, 
Uh, I got. I know the perfect man for the job. Yeah. Let's just hire Flavio Briatore. Ah, yes. There you go. Yeah. He know. He knows. He knows designs. He knows what to do. He can throw a bunch of. Stuff. He he'll give us tons of quotes, and he'll mess the sport up irrevocably. So I can't wait. Uh, one final thing on LMP2 I do just want to read out here are the gaps on the last uh, at the end of the race the gaps between the top 5 LMP2 cars just just for a little bit of uh, uh, like you know just because it's interesting so WRT won by 6 seconds it was 9 seconds back to 3rd place 7 seconds beyond that was 4th 4 seconds behind that was 5th and less than a second was 6th so you know that's 6 cars within what is that 25 seconds of the leader and, like, the last mm-hmm. safety car was an hour and a half out from the finish. Like, LMP2, consistently good. Absolutely. Uh, last little bit about Spa. Uh, the GTM. Like, quick, uh, Cookie, who, who needs GTE pro, pro, right? We don't need GTE Pro. Who needs all the professional class? When we have such good quality GTM racing, like, my gosh, GTM. Mwah, so good. So good. So good. <clears throat> uh, Honestly, it's great. Uh, I wish I, I wish there's a way to keep continuing it, <laughs> uh, but you wouldn't be able to. You know, there's just not enough manufacturer support now to create evos of any of the cars that exist. Yeah, but, they're all uh, going away. They're all going away. But yeah, it's it's it genuinely does uh, force a case to be made for just not even needing a pro uh, class at all, especially with the GT3 introduction um, incoming. So. I, I would be okay if it stays <laughs> GTM um, or GTM, uh, just because it is producing fantastic racing. And at this point, it is going to just be the sole backfill for you know um, <laughs> whatever cars that aren't hypercar at this point. So it it would be a great uh, addition, I think, or just at least to make sure it stays. Um, I yeah, I. I really enjoyed that race. Uh, I, I was pulling for the Aaron Dames. The uh, Aston Martins were driving really <laughs> cheeky, man. They were, bro. They were doing, bro. They were. <laughs> I had yeah, that. Man. Oh I'm gonna crap! Have to put, I'm uh, gonna have to put that in. I'm gonna have to put that in. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. okay. No, no okay. swearing on my family-friendly cod, uh, cod past podcast cookie. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, sh- well shit. <laughs> Uh, uh, but yeah, no, the Aston but, Martin, uh, ORT by TF Sport Aston Martin, and the, the not Northwest, the Heart of Racing Aston Martin as well, had a bit of uh, time in the sun uh, as well. So they, they they finally figured something out. They did, they did. Um, definitely, they yeah, elbows were out too um, when they were when they were trying to get around uh, some of the traffic. But yeah, it was it was great. Um, you know, ebbs and, uh, excuse me, ebbs and flows of the amp drivers versus pro drivers in there. Um, the mix of strategy too that was affected by the safety car, uh, and yeah, I uh, great solid race. If you know, if we didn't have spectacular races in the other categories, um, we would easily be talking about this as being just another fantastic GTM race that definitely highlights you know a down weekend for uh, the series. It's just that surprisingly we had a pretty damn good race for all three of all them. three classes so, yeah. Uh, yeah one thing i am loving about gtm at the moment is that it's really shining a spotlight on some of the drivers that uh have been not forgotten forgotten isn't the right word but have not quite gotten the accolades that they maybe should have in other classes and other series and i want to pull out uh three names to start with um so the first one i want to play out is um alessio rivera uh in in the number 83 ricard mill racing team uh the eighth course the car the, the race winning car and we'll get back to that in a moment uh as well though nikki katzberg we have seen in the last two races some absolute defensive masterclass by Katzberg uh, in that Corvette. It, it was to win in Portimao ahead of uh, Alessio Rivera, and it was to take second place against Charlie Eastwood in uh, in Spa Francorchamps. But Katzberg, boy, howdy, does he know get, how to get the the elbows out? Um, I also want to point out as well and make a note on. Uh, ooh, there was someone else, and I've forgotten them, and that makes me uh, sad and angry, and we might have to come back to that. But, but like, <laughs> Rivera and, and, and Katzberg, uh, unbelievable driving from them acro- across the weekend. Uh, that, that last lap battle between the Corvette and the Aston Martin was absolutely awesome. Um, and I think yes. it, it has been wonderful to see these uh, maybe 
uh, lesser known, less successful, not because they've not been good, uh, but because they just haven't been the right machinery. Uh, these drivers get their chance in GTM machinery and also elevate the quality of the likes of the silver drivers and the bronze drivers around them. Absolutely. Um, and then again, the fact that you have <clears throat> Iron Dames threatening for a class win uh, pretty much uh, every round and having um, you know the story of Lilu as well be a thing especially that grabs attention yeah the first great. class winner in wc history cookie the first class winner in w- uh, the first female class winner in wc history yeah that's, that's awesome that's pretty I mean, cool yeah uh, i mean and again it, it's it's not it's not just like i don't want to say an asterisk thing or anything like that like great pace like how she to was do awesome. it anyway she was awesome yeah. and she's what she's like 19 or 20 yep She's yep. she's got a Le Mans class winner in in, in her somewhere, whether that be I'm this year GTM or in the, right the now, future. Man. Yeah, yeah. So uh, also, we we forgot to talk about the uh, Porsche Ferrari battle last lap. Uh in the in the hypercars. Hypercar, yeah, yeah. I kind of blocked that from my memory because uh, yeah. the the Porsche. I know lost. you did. <laughs> yeah, no, you did. I was gonna actually. I'll ask you right now. How uh, give me a sit rep for uh, for Porsche fandom right now? How you how, how you feeling about the car, about the team? What's uh... okay. um, let's let's see the car. I I I. So it's no nine nineteen. Uh, when Porsche jumped into the WC with a nine nineteen, you could immediately see that there was something special in that car. Um, I don't think the nine six three quite has that yet. I was hoping that it was going to be more on pace with the Ferrari and the Toyota from the off. That hasn't happened. Uh, the the fact that it had a full electrical shutdown from third position in the first race that it's really been doing well. Mm, not thrilled about that. Um, and it looks like there's it's just not quite right. You know what I'm saying? Um, it, it doesn't quite feel like Porsche just yet. Um, I'm not sure if that's the, the car, the team or the package or the drivers, um, but it doesn't quite feel there yet. So, um, I'm going to be honest, I'm not confident heading into Le Mans, Um, but I am confident that by the end of the season, we will be seeing better results for Porsche. That's, that's kind of where I'm at. Is there going to be a point where you, you'll take the Jota over the, uh, over the, uh, Penske's? Hey, mate, 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 if... Porsche know how to do anything well. It's how to create a customer base for prototypes. So if we get into a situation where we've got like, it's 1983 and we've got a top 10 filled with 963s, I don't care who's on the top step. I'm just going to be having a blast. <laughs> okay. Okay. I got you. <laughs> uh, well, uh, hey, like, that I'm was sure, I'm so... sure, I'm sure Penske won't be happy though. If the Jota car starts beating them to qual- uh, to podiums and race wins. Well, I mean, their track record for IMSA isn't that great either. We're taking the a- yeah. AXR to anything, but well, I, mean, I mean, they they, they, they they've done stuff. They they've did, done. They did win. A Long they've Beach won champion. The they've won a championship. They did win Long Beach yeah. in the nine six three. They did win Long Beach. Okay. In the nine six three, the yeah. most recent race yeah. in the championship. Yeah. Oh, that it, it, it's right. A uh, street race. It's the most recent race in the IMSA championship. I'm competing against two. Uh, Want to race against, two, before BMW. Two independent Acura teams, essentially, because one doesn't really want to talk to the other one. And I mean, yeah. Also, the like, Cadillac didn't put it in the wall in the penultimate lap. Uh, that's true. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, almost got overtaken. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, that was my Franca Champs, and I've got to say that's probably been the best race of the hypercar era, and probably the best uh, WEC race. Since 2016, I want to say, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm also, I'm also feeling some Ferrari hype too, man. Yeah, dude, they're, Ferrari, they're, Ferrari, they're getting there. Ferrari looks good. If they solve turning their tires on properly, like they're gonna be, dude, it's gonna be so good. <laughs> it's gonna be so yeah. good. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, Lamar should be pretty good. I don't know how Peugeot are gonna look. I'm, I, I feel like I need to start getting ready to eat some crow on that one. And that I'm, call earlier in the year, but you know, we'll see. You know what I'm most excited about for the Peugeot program? Oh no, the the Lego kit. <sighs> like I've already I've already bought it. It's on its way here. I'm 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 oh, quite excited shoot. for that. Okay, yeah, all right, okay. yeah, I, I like it because uh, I've got all the other Speed Champions one. I got the the knockoff prototype, the RSR, and the 488. So I got to get the Peugeot. 
It's going to mm-hmm. happen. Uh, that was oh, fun. That thing looks awesome. Too, it, so. it, uh, it does look awesome. I, I quite like the Le Mans livery. I hope they keep that because it looks psychedelic, but in a good way. Um, Spa, that's done. You mentioned IMSA. Let's talk about IMSA. We had some news in the last week that IMSA is formally going to uninvite LMP3 for next season. Uh, this is something we've talked about two or three times already in the podcast. Uh, Cookie, your thoughts? Uh, f- totally fine with it. Ha ha ha. See ya. Okay. I, I, I agree. I, I think it was uh, t- too many cars and uh, n- not enough skill. I just didn't even think it was necessary to begin with to have them in there. I, I just, it, they, I don't know why you put them in there. It, it, it would make sense if there was literally less, if like they didn't have LMP2, throw LMP, LMP3 in there. I'm fine with that. You just didn't need both of them in there. It didn't make sense. So yeah, I'm fine with it. Especially after the, the first two races, well, the Daytona and Sebring, uh, where we saw a number of uh, instances with MP- LMP3 cars. Uh, yeah, I-, I think it's it's been the right call. That was quick. I was expecting that to last at least two minutes. Okay, we're moving on. Um, <laughs> well, I, like, I'm, and I'm fine with them being in the prototype challenge thing or whatever that they're in with the uh, with the GT fours. Like, that's that's where they should be yeah. in IMSA. And I think that something like that should uh, be a thing in Europe. I know they have the LMP3 GT3. I think LMP3 GT4 would be better. But okay. Not not as big of a GT4 scene in in ACL Europe as it is over here in US. So, well, there's because uh, I think the GT4 specifically is an SRO product. So, oh, you, that's right. Never mind. That's to, why. That's yeah, why. You got to have the ACO talk to the SRO, and you, we know how much they hate talking to each other, Cookie. Well, I mean, you know, if this whole thing warms them up with each other with GT3 running an ACO, we could we could see some. Some interest in uh, in Michelin Lamar Lamar Great. Cup. Lamar, Lamar, That's it. Michelin Lamar, Lamar Cup. Lamar Challenge. Yeah, there's, there's call it, so, call it Lamar dude, Challenge. I, I got I got torn between IMS and WC. I was like Michelin Lamar p- p- prototype Michelin challenge. Pi- pilot uh, sp- pilot cup. pilot pilot sport. Just keep going. Just keep going, uh, Cookie. You get it. <laughs> Endurance World <laughs> Cup. Uh, All right. Uh, uh, another another thing. Yeah, okay, and then. The more 24 entry list, right? Oh, okay. I want to leave that to the end. I do want to just chuck another thing in here real quickly. Um, the Bathurst 12 Hour uh, has announced its date for next year, which will be two weeks later in the year compared to it was uh, when it was this year. It'll be the 15th and 16th of February next year. Um, uh, your thoughts? Um, if you have any. If you're can- capable of complex emotion. No, I, I I am, but I don't see uh, an issue. So I'm yeah. like, okay, that's cool. cool. I might be able to provide a little bit of uh, background on this then. Um, so uh, at the Bathurst 12 Hour, I was a part of a roundtable discussion with Shane Rudzis, Ru- Rudzis, who is the event director. And something that he did drop in just kind of out of nowhere was that they were looking at changing the date uh, specifically to reduce the load of the the Daytona Bathurst, you know, back to back weekends sort of thing, um, to try and can, yeah yeah to yeah. Tr- to try and entice more entries, more one off entries um, from the states and from uh, Asia uh, to to uh, so that way they they you know because you get more entries then um, so I think moving it two weeks back it keeps it in the same slot of the year, which is a good thing. Um, cause I think the February date is, is the date. Um, I think it's a nice place in the sports car calendar, the nice place in the Australian sports calendar. So it's kind of in that weird in between, uh, cricket season and footy season. Uh, and for you cookie, that's whoosh, right? <laughs> um, uh, yes. Yeah. Yep. Totally. Um, and uh, that's, that's like, that's like just after the Super Bowl. That's like right when the Daytona 500 is. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. So it's in, it's in that weird sort of post cricket malaise where it's like, okay, what do we do now until footy starts? Um, so I think that's a, that's a good slot for it. It means that there's more time for the uh, the teams to get their stuff together over Christmas, um, and hopefully it'll attract yeah more one-off entries from America and Europe because it's still you know far enough away from the European season to be a one-off. Um, but you know in that nice little slot between Daytona and Sebring, uh, which will you know mean the American teams are prepared. So I think it's a a good decision. Um, it does mean that I'm going to have to take you know, more time off of work in the middle of term because I work in a school, um, which is a, li- a little more annoying, but I'm totally okay with that. Um, and yeah, I, I, I'd i see only good things uh, with this change, uh, which is good. It's great. 
I'm, yeah. I'm I'm fine with it. It uh it yeah. Any anything to to give it some extra padding between major events uh in the sports car universe and as well as the other racing universes besides NASCAR because haha, what are you gonna see in that crossover? Um it's fine. <laughs> Um, okay, now let's talk about Le Mans entry list. So, Le Mans entry list for the centenary event of Le Mans, uh, the final provisional entry list with all the drivers in place was released on uh, Thursday, Thursday, Friday. So, at the, at the time of recording, three days ago, um, we have on the Le Mans entry list cookie, a juicy 16 top class cars, 16 hyper cars. Uh, so, the addition of a Cadillac, a Porsche, a another Cadillac and a Glickenhaus. Um, we have 24 LMP2 cars, 24, uh, and 21 GTE cars in GTM. Because, of course, we don't have GTE Pro anymore. So we do have a slight unbalance between pro- overall prototypes and overall GTEs, but we still have 20 GTE cars, and we have 24 LMP2 cars, and we have 16 hypercars. What? I'm quite excited. Yeah. Oh, and of course, let's not forget uh, something from your neck of the woods, the Garage 56 entry, the friggin' NASCAR. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> Honestly, it's... Uh, for the 100-year event, I mean, it's it's got a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, so we've got the, the most the most top-class entries uh, since 2014, when we had... Uh, 2015, rather, when we had 14. So that in itself is exciting enough. Man, just just staring at some of this is just uh it's so much. I mean, it's it is crazy to look at that because I mean, we've seen I think we've talked about uh previous Le Mans to, uh Le Mans, uh previous Le Mans 2 where it's uh 15 16 car grids with the GTE Pro and we're like, man, this is just nuts. I mean, we yeah. have Porsche, Corvette, a Ferrari, Dodge, a Ford, like if all this uh you know, manufacturer BMW. involvement Aston Martin, yeah, uh, just generating a lot of hype, and you know, to see to see it just sitting at the top of the top of the chart for the entry list is is kind of surreal. It's good, <laughs> like, and yeah, and, and like we we have customer prototypes in the top class of Le Mans, which we haven't had. <laughs> like, how long has it been since we've had that? Man, I, I just such a long time, mm. uh, and. Again, this is just what we were saying the last, uh, you can know, how many years? Two, three, uh, where it's just, you know, 2023, this is going to be the year where it's just going to take off, and yep. here it is. And yep. I mean, we're finally here, and this is what we're going to get. So um, uh, I'm, I'm still pulling for Toro to win, but man, I would love to see uh, Ferrari uh, give him some give him some hell i i i genuinely think this is going to be an, an insane race i yeah. just i don't think i'll see toyota walk away with it so Ooh. if yeah. only if only um something i have I, I do find interesting is that there's uh five american flags in the hypercar as well that seems wrong <laughs> doesn't it yeah it really does it's the american invasion my friend oh no you can't run from it i can't want, hide from it one two um <laughs> So that's that's just hypercar. Uh, just quickly looking down the list in prototype uh, LMP2 and GTM, and if you are listening, we will figure out some way to split all of this so we can fit it into two entry list podcasts. Because we might even do three. We might even do an hour podcast on each class. So that's still yeah. stuff to think about in the future. Um, is there anything that immediately jumps out at you? Um, when you look down the entry list at LMP2 and GTM, is there anything that that really just grabs you by the scruff of the neck and goes, "Pay attention to me"? Um, yeah, nothing immediately yet sticking out. Uh, but I'm sure I'll I'll find something. <laughs> uh, definitely, uh, the team WRT has got some good lineups. Um, as well as United Auto Sport, but they just haven't. I haven't really seen the pace out of United Auto Sport as much the first few rounds, but they'll they'll definitely come to their own. Um, yeah, I mean uh, some of the WC stalwarts that we see here are great. Um, and let's see here, I think there was another one that I was liking in LMP2. Oh, I can't see it anymore. There's but... there's one which has got Jan Magnussen behind the wheel. That's pretty cool. Yes, that I did see that. Uh, and then yeah, some of the some of the silvers in here too. Uh, 
for at least uh, the LMP2 are quite interesting. So Manuel uh, Maldonado's in there for Panis. Uh, uh, Peroto in the AF Corsa with that 80 again. But yeah, so uh, GTEM as well has got some crazy ones. Obviously the 911 uh, with uh, Michael Fassbender. Uh, you know, Christian Reed obviously with uh, WC uh, as well. Because for me, it's just, it's Double trying to find which silvers and bronze are oh, the best are ones, paired yeah. together. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, and then uh, Ben Keating as well with uh, uh, for Rome. Yeah. So, I I think we'll definitely see like Iron Dames up there, Corvette. But yeah, some of the extra entries here are going to be great. Yeah. I'm definitely interested to see what Michael Fassbender does. Well, he's like, not going to have pace, but you well, know, he he wasn't too bad last year, and he he's certainly been improving. Like I think the the ELMS race at Barcelona was his best race so far by like miles and miles and miles, and it was unfortunate that Martin Rump in the car got taken out by an LMP3 car, um, because they were in a good position to get a podium, uh, like unironically. So Fassbender, he, he might actually have uh something a fire under his butt this time. mm Hmm. Um, and then obviously the uh, the garage fifty six century, uh, like just just looking at Jensen Button in Driver Three makes me smile. <laughs> yeah, freaking Formula One World Champion Jensen Button driving a NASCAR at Le Mans, like <laughs> uh, uh, doesn't that sentence endurance sound endurance racing modified NASCAR? Doesn't that at, sentence at sound Dude, so wrong in like four different it's, ways? It does. It does. His first stint, I just want to be glued to that in car if they have it. I just, I, all I want to do is watch that. Just watch his first stint. That's uh, going to be amazing. Just, just to see the shit show. <laughs> um, something that jumped out to me, Cookie. Uh, two things that jumped out to me. Um, first thing is that there's a strong Pro-Am uh, lineup in uh, the, the LMP2 car, which I think is good. And I think is, uh, it shows a bit more health in that class. I do quite like how much emphasis the ACO is placing on Pro-Am Motorsports um, with their own class, with their own category in ELMS um, for the bronze drivers. And, like, we saw an overall win by a Pro-Am car last time out. So, like, who even needs LMP2 not Pro-Am? Am I right? Damn. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I would love it if it was just Pro-Am like that. Or, you know, again, I mean, LMP2 is just a complete bastard of what it should have been. So, it's yeah. not even, like, you know, like... All of the oh well, is it prima proper to do this or that? Who cares? I mean, you have a it's a one make series, and that was do the thing too. Yeah. Is just and I will say, like if any if anybody is is uh, uh, you know wants to go uh, to try to correct people, not necessarily correct people, but just be like oh LMP two is great, you know, like it was such a great race. So like you know just uh, the category is just so good. If you get new fans that are like, well, yeah, I'm just not that much interested in it because it's a one make series, like. Dude, there's not you, there's not really anything to say to that. You just kind of just go like, <laughs> well, okay, it, 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 right. it wasn't meant to be. It wasn't meant to be, but like, if uh, like, there's definitely that the <clears throat> the sting of it a little bit for me is just the fact that it's all the same car. Yeah, like, I just it it hurts me internally inside. Well, then, Cookie, like I said at the same like, time, but a sidebar uh, question: Is the Orica 07 the best prototype that's ever existed? No. Okay, that's fine. Um, we'll move on from that. Uh, something else I wanted to point out is that uh, there's no real, like, I'm going to use this word, and I'm, uh, I formally apologize to every single team I've described in the past as this, but, like, there's no dud teams. Every single LMP2 car has a silver driver or a bronze driver and two pro drivers. Like, there's no three old French guys in a Labra competition Ligue anymore. Like, every single team in LMP2 could feasibly have a chance at winning this race. Like that, that and uh, all, all the teams have had some, some history of success in some form or fashion. Yeah. Uh, like we, we don't, we don't have like green teams that are just starting sort of in, um, in WC or, or whatever that have gained entry to this. It's, it's all like legendary stalwart teams or teams that have proven themselves recently. Um, so it's literally just stacked with talent in, yeah. in terms of uh, even just the team showing up with the chassis and the, like, and the, like uh, the only team that looks maybe even a little out of place is like DKR engineering who have been stepping their way up the, uh, the ACO ladder, but even still they're racing in the pro-am category and they have Maxime Martin in that car. <laughs> that was one of the ones where I was like, okay, you got that guy. <laughs> right. Not, 
it's not going to matter how how many bronze you're going to stick in that uh, bronze or silver. It's still going to be uh, it's still going to be his drive. It's going to be a bullet, <laughs> for the yeah. most part. Yeah. Um, so that's that's one of the things I picked out. Um, as well, something I did notice looking at the reserve list is just how much quality there is in the reserve list. Like I was going to mention that too. Yeah, yeah, the first car off the rank is the uh, the Spirit of Race car, the Duncan Cameron, Matt Griffin, David Perel car, which is like a car that has won European Le Mans series races in the past and they don't even get an invite. They are on the reserve list. The Dragon Speed L- USA car, that car won LMP2 Pro Am last year year or the year before but you know uh henrik hedman formerly raced an lmp1 car for a season and like they don't get on the entry list they get on the reserve list like the the quality that we have access to at the moment it's kind of nuts yes oh yeah and that dragon speed has the montoya family in that as well potentially um yeah it's and then not to mention all the other ones i mean even the uh, even going all the way down to Garage 59, TF Sport, uh, our Bratislava, like all these teams have been here, done that in some <laughs> form or fashion. The LMS, Asian Le Mans series, or WC or Le Mans. So. Just quickly, look at uh, look at who's the the one nominated driver for the Team Project One on the reserve <laughs> list. Freaking Formula One driver, Is that Glock? Timo Glock. <laughs> and that's and that's the quality that's on the reserve list. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's it's absolutely nuts. This is uh this is going to be a banner year at Le Mans for sure. It's going to be incredible. Um, and we will as as always do our normal entry list podcast. I quite like the idea of an hour for each class. I I think that'll work really really nicely. I think that works best. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then just like the the garage fifty six gets its own hour. <laughs> <laughs> it should. It really should. <laughs> Uh, we'll have enough to talk about as it is with that. Uh, maybe, maybe, that, that maybe that's something that you and Chris can just have to yourselves. It'll just be 20 minutes of us laughing at the entire idea itself happening on the centennial. Uh, yeah, uh, hey, like, it's the centenary edition. Like, like of, surely they could do some like historic car and just like talk, it, like pull one of the 962s out of the storage and like send out in a few laps in the race. No, they get a freaking NASCAR. <laughs> yep. It's... Yep, showcasing the latest in uh, NASCAR technology. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. just... We'll put lights on it and brakes. We'll give it a diffuser. <laughs> or a uh... bigger diffuser, I'm sorry, because they actually have diffusers now. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, they're they're like, they're they're pretty, I mean, they're not exactly the same as the as supercars, but <laughs> they're getting really close. Well, the, super, like... the supercars have just gone into a new generation, so they look kind of different now. They got like the... Well, I mean, yeah, you guys are using the Camaro as well. Camaro and Mustang. Yeah. Oh. I mean, it, and not just because of the same models, but like, I mean, they're carbon fiber. I don't... They're not tube frame anymore, I don't think. Holy uh, damn. What's happening they've got to... Diffusers, what's happening to single, this backwards redneck sport? <laughs> single nut wheels. So there's no, there's no lug nuts anymore. It's single nut. Mate, um, you're, you're about to make me actually watch it. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah. that they wasn't ra- that wasn't the direction I was going for. I was going to say oh, okay. single knot. They but... race on <laughs> they they race on dirt. Uh, they have way more road courses and street courses this year now. So, oh yeah, hot damn! They're doing the whole supercar transition. Are they, are they still doing the stage? Are they still doing stage races? They are, but they're they're doing a few races where they don't go to yellow with them anymore. So they just they just Keep award going. points at certain points. Yeah. And it's oh, been- so it's basically like an SRO race then. Yeah, it's been it's been fantastic. <laughs> it's like, oh, you don't break up because then the nice thing about that too, and here's an off rant that we'll I'll have with Chris uh, on our uh, final stint podcast coming up at some point. We need to record that. Uh, it's just like. This is this is fantastic. I mean, you basically just you keep in the uh, the com- the designated commercial breaks because American uh, American TV has to have commercial breaks. Yeah, and it it like you can have an elongated commercial break for that, and just a complete cut segment while it's still green, and then just review anything that happened. So yeah, you do miss some stuff live, but it's it, you know it's coming up. It's going to happen at this point, and then you can just get the rest of it out of the way. And just watch the rest of the race, or at least like not have it affect the actual racing, because that I mean to me that's like that was half of it was the whole point of that anyway it was just to put designated commercial breaks into the race broadcast because you never had a chance to do that. So I just feel like this is like okay, fine, award the points, give it give it a, a reason for them to race it, 
but then just remove the freaking cautions and you 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 remove a lot of the heart the just the problems that have kind of mired the sport because it it takes a lot of it out of the racing because it's like we you're watching like three separate races that are kind of like two of the first are meaningless essentially mm. yeah so it's anyway. like it's like yeah. you, you you race 54 laps around the Albert Park Grand Prix circuit and then do a red flag oh, no. standing start and then do a red flag oh, no. standing start like oh no <laughs> <laughs> I've been wanting to get off my chest uh, for you. Uh, okay. okay, we're gosh. about time to wrap up, Cookie. Um, to finish off, uh, who's going to win Le Mans? Uh, who's going to win Le Mans? Toyota's going to win Le Mans. Who's going to win in LMP2? Ferrari. That's... No. <laughs> LMP2, not P2. Uh, WRT. Which one? Uh, 31. Who's going to win in Pro-Am? In LMP2 Pro-Am? Uh, the the nine eleven. No, in LMP two, you spud Nick. Oh, what? No, I said LMP two. Uh, no, but LMP2... in LMP two, LMP two Pro Am. Oh, Pro Am. Uh, Racing Team Turkey. Who's gonna win in GTE Am? Uh, eighty five. How far is the NASCAR gonna get? Is is how far does what get? How far is the NASCAR gonna get? Oh, uh, I think he completes the whole race. He's going to finish the race? Yeah. Would that make it the first Garage 56 car to finish the race? Uh, um, well, I'm sure there's another one that, that did. Imagine, but... imagine if you will, if the Cadillac wins overall and the NASCAR gets to the end of the race and the Corvette uh, I, wins GTM. I would definitely commit Sudoku for sure. <laughs> You just the, as the, a Toyota, the, the power as a Toyota of, fan, the, the power of the patriot, uh, like the patriotism flowing through you, would just be too much to contain. Look, I, I think my worst case, my nightmare scenario is Cadillac wins this year. Really, I would, I would take anyone else. I even I would as an even American, take Porsche. I, I would even take Porsche winning over Cadillac. Yeah, even as an American, why? Because the next year would be completely insufferable. <laughs> <laughs> Just the flood of the flood of American fans who have no idea what's going on into the, the community. Oh, God, the amount of like boasting and stuff, and I like there'd be nothing I could say. And I'm a huge Toyota fan, and I'd just be like, oh, yeah, "That's right, I <laughs> yeah, we, we lost. Cadillac, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's Christ. great, <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be awful." So okay, so we, that. We don't I, want I'm not hoping that they lose, but I'm definitely hoping Toyota win. <laughs> I just or, want or everyone, anybody else win. I just want everyone to have a nice, fun time, and also for Porsche to win. Uh, All right. Wait, I, then as you say that, I also don't want Porsche. To win. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, come to the dark uh, side, Cookie. Porsche must no, I win. Don't, oh, I don't want them to win. Anyway. I think that's the end. I think that I think we've wrapped everything. Oh, up. okay. All right. All right. Cool. All right. Who do you? Uh, yeah. So okay. uh, Ditto to all your stuff. Yeah. Let's hear your uh, uh, selections. I uh, uh, number eight Toyota wins. I hate saying that. That's gross. Uh, yes. I I, oh, I I think maybe maybe Ferrari wins LMDH LMH point five hypercar point five. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think the Ferraris, if they manage everything correctly, should easily mm. come in second. Uh, who's Wait. who's going to win LMP2? Right. Um, it's a great question. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, United Auto Sports number 22. I reckon they, they figure it out. Oh, no, they don't. I didn't see Frederick moving Alpine? that car. I, I don't I don't know. Um, uh, Prema Racing, Dorian Pin wins a little more. There we go. Oh, there we go. That's cool. Um, <laughs> Pro Am, uh, Perotto. It's got he's got Ben Barnico and Norman Nato driving with him. How does he not win that? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> they might find a way though. They might find a way. Um, and I think um, I'm kind of intrigued as to what the Kessel Racing Car is going to do in GTM. I don't think they're going to win, but I'm kind of intrigued. You know what? I'm gonna. I hate myself. I think the Corvette's going to win Lamar. Yeah, I mean they have they by far have the ability to do it. It's uh, true, and and considering their their BOP is pretty good right now, I don't see a, a ton of adjustment needed for them. Like they they should be they should be good. Yeah, they have a good shot at winning. That hurt to say. <laughs> I mean, I love I love I love I love I love, I love uh, uh, Ben Keating. 
Um, and I think Nicky Katzberg, if he's in the right position at the end of the race, he's going to take it home. But uh, that hurt to say. <laughs> Are there any Australian auto manufacturers that you can kind of feel national pride in at no, all? No, not anymore. Uh, the Australian auto industry is is toast. Like, uh, Brabham exists, but they said they were going to make a GTE, and then they didn't. So, like, you know, stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> nah, there's there's not yeah, really... not really Rip to Commodore, Rip to... Co- uh, uh, Holden is entirely Rip now. It doesn't exist. Yeah. 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 Big sad. Was that, was, that the, was that the biggest manufacturer you guys had down uh, there? The, probably the, the largest commercial, like, yeah, the largest um, consumer manufacturer, certainly. Because, um, like, in my lifetime, uh, you had the Holden manufacturing, you had Ford in Australia, and you had Toyota in Australia. But now Toyota imports all their cars, I think. Um, Ford mm-hmm. imports all their cars, and Holden doesn't exist, so. Oh, man. Yay. And you guys and you guys love cars so much. It's so it's so sad. Yeah, look, that's complicated government things that I don't want to get into. <laughs> okay, yeah, fair. Yeah. Fair. It's it's it had not been profitable for a long time, so they packed up and ran away, which is sad. We Yeah. Um <laughs> I'd I'd love a bo- uh, I'd love like a boutique manufacturer like Rabham to actually make a car. That would be amazing. Um or like Brabham. Brabham is the only one. Or you, you, you're you going to get somebody to just make boutique. You know, he, he, here's a realistic thing. It'll be somebody that uses Peter Brock's name and makes Brock boutique just, just makes to- a Toronto replicas. <laughs> and you can okay, buy an, A9, you can buy an A9X Toronto or a new prototype. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, you could easily see somebody just using the name and starting to make like modern pro- like cars with it. You're like, no, 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 they wouldn't do that. <laughs> no, if they're going to use they would Brock's just make... name, they they're going to make <laughs> they're going to make replicas. That's what they're going to do. <laughs> They'd be like uh, using Dale oh, Earnhardt's good. name and like making modern consumer. Vi- no, you're not. You're going to make friggin' replica NASCARs. Of course you are. <sighs> Man. Am I wrong? I, you, make, you make you make modern NASCARs. No, uh, you know what? Now I'm thinking of like if there was an Earnhardt like car net, like just a little boutique car manufacturer. You know how many people would buy those cars? I, even I do. If they didn't make collect like every, uh, every car is called the Earnhardt Model Three. <laughs> it would <laughs> no, it would be like Earnhardt Model Three Hundred One, something like that. They would do the three at the beginning. But yeah. yeah. Oh my god! Anyway, uh, I, uh, thanks for <laughs> thanks for sticking around. Yeah, I think I, I, if you if you enjoyed the last five minutes of us rambling, I'm I'm very glad you did. Uh, yeah. we, we will have another episode of From the Grandstands recording tomorrow, so keep an ear out for that when that gets posted, probably later in the week. Um, we will have another great episode of Cooking in Chris's final stint at some point in the next few, maybe week or so. Hopefully, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we will have a preview for the Nürburgring 24 hour coming up soon um, because that is on the radar as well we can't just talk about Le Mans Nürburgring is on, on the way um, and then we will be gearing up for the centenary event of the Le Mans 24 hours because holy shit Cookie it is like 5 weeks away yeah it creeped up really quick like it, it, super it's quick super quick um, and that is going to be <laughs> that's going to be something very very special it's been a pleasure to have you I'm... all along the ride for us thank you cookie for this intimate hour and a half yeah yeah thanks for having me on i i will say and in addition to your announcements i probably will be missing some of them because i'll <gasps> be at a wedding <sighs> the week before Le Mans. so but i will be back uh for the week of and uh, obviously the weekend of the mall so i will be um up and able but uh you, you, i might miss some of our recordings you, but we'll you see know you know what's great cookie about the weekend of the mall what it's a public holiday in australia on the monday ah uh, ah uh. so see that just makes it way better so especially good. for you yeah yeah because it means it's just that like, I have yeah, a potato recovery. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember multiple times in which you'd be like, oh, this is, uh, this, you know, it's great, but I, it's just awful. <laughs> the next day, <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah, the next day is just the worst. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm going to have a good time. We're all going to have a good time. You know why? Because we're all here to enjoy this golden era. The of golden sports age yeah. of sports. Ah, we said it. Thank you very much for also, listening. Oh, dude. Yeah. 
<laughs> the Lamada entry list is stacked. Fuck. Yeah. Uh, now we can go. Now we can leave. All right, bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs> Guys, ooh. Oh, I had that perfect. ending lined up so perfectly, and you had to ruin it. Oh! I know. <laughs> I should. I should have said something too.